speaking for lawyers. This is program two entitled Channeling Your Adrenaline. At the end of this program, you'll have some tools to help you channel the anxiety you're feeling into the excitement of performance. You'll be able to psych yourself up, not out. You'll learn to literally channel that adrenaline rush that we all feel into dynamic and confident delivery. You'll be able to appear at ease and in control regardless of how you're feeling inside. This program is all about our bodies. How does your body function when you're speaking in public? And the very first topic that we always address when we're talking about our body is adrenaline. When we stand to speak in public, no matter the situation, we all have an adrenaline rush. Sometimes it's a big rush if it's a big room with a lot of people or a very important client, maybe you're talking to a senior partner. Sometimes it's a smaller adrenaline rush. It's hard to predict exactly how adrenaline will manifest itself in any given situation, but we can rely on the fact that we will have an adrenaline rush. So let's just think about what happens to our body as we stand to speak, our name has been called, and suddenly it's our turn. Our body is always trying to help us negotiate stressful situations. And when we stand to speak, our emotional brain detects that stress may be present. So our adrenal glands dispense adrenaline to help us get through any stressful situation. Now, hundreds of thousands of years ago, when we may have needed an adrenaline rush during a stressful situation to escape the saber-toothed tiger or outrun the neighboring warriors who were coming after us, we needed adrenaline. We needed adrenaline to infuse our bodies with the energy and the heart rate and the fast breath that it might take to do one of two things, either stand and fight or run away, flee. Adrenaline is the fight or flight hormone. It's very useful in situations where we have to think fast and run or fight to defend ourselves or get out of the way. But when we stand to speak, it's not so useful. The last thing we need when we are standing to say something important and complicated is a huge adrenaline rush, which makes our heart rate increase, makes our blood pressure go up, makes the hair on our arms stand on end. It makes our pupils dilate and then get small, making reading kind of difficult. Adrenaline stops our digestion so that it can divert resources to the large muscles in our body we might need to run or fight. But think about it. If my digestion stops, I've lost all saliva. My saliva stops, so I stop digesting, so more resources can go elsewhere. That can give me cotton mouth. If you've ever stood up to speak and you've said, Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I don't appear to have any spit left in my entire body. And you feel like your entire mouth is dry. It's an adrenaline effect. So the very first task we all face when we are standing up to speak is that we have to channel that excitement. When we feel our heart rate go up, when we feel our breath coming more quickly, we have to have a technique that can calm those effects down. So we're constantly trying to figure out what is adrenaline doing to us? How is it distracting us? And how can we counteract those distractions? They're inevitable. You will get an adrenaline rush, maybe a big one, maybe a small one. So you'll have to think about this. Now, I've only talked about adrenaline's 
adverse effects, the distracting ones, the, dis the ones that trigger fears and anxiety, the emergency effects. But adrenaline has wonderful effects as well. Adrenaline can keep you alert. It can keep you sharp, can keep you awake for the very important thing you're about to say. So dwell on adrenaline's good effects. It's the excitement hormone. The one we use if we practice thrill sports, for example, jumping out of airplanes or rock climbing, surfing, anything thrilling and fun relies on adrenaline to make it wonderful. So focus on what a good thing adrenaline can be. Yes, I'm excited. This is going to be fun. And try to mitigate the downside of adrenaline. The rest of our techniques about our body have that in mind. How can we mitigate adrenaline's effects and just cherry pick the really good ones? Now let's focus on the specific body parts that are most affected by adrenaline because adrenaline is a very targeted hormone. As part of that fight or flight that Marsha was talking about, it's sending energy to legs, breath, and arms most specifically. So our first job is to get control of your legs. Think about this. You need a proper stance as the public speaker. Before a golfer swings a golf club, what do they do? They adopt the appropriate stance. The baseball player in the batter's box, before they swing the bat, they plant their feet with an appropriate stance. The basketball player at the free throw line, before they throw the ball, they adopt a stance. So here is the instruction you say to yourself. Plant your feet and stand still. Plant your feet and stand still. And then Newton's law of motion becomes Newton's law of public speaking. A body at rest will tend to stay at rest. You tell your feet to stand still, plant those feet, you will be a body at rest. Here's the problem. If you begin to speak without planting your feet, good morning, I'm Brian Johnson and I haven't thought about my feet because that's not what I'm thinking about as a public speaker, a body in motion will do what? Tend to stay in motion. So, plant your feet and stand still. Now think about how adrenaline, as a natural response to that energy that adrenaline gives us, wants us to move. It's fight or flight, in this case flight. So have you ever stood in front of an audience and had your knees knock? What is that? It's adrenaline. Why are they knocking? Because adrenaline goes into specific muscles. But because every muscle in the body is paired with another muscle, if you send energy into both muscles, the result is the shakes. It makes for knocking knees. It makes for quivering voices. It makes for shaking hands. It's adrenaline. It's not a character flaw. But that energy source needs to be given some very conscious direction. So here's how we're going to give that very conscious direction to your feet. Let's start by rejecting what doesn't work very well. In fact, my suggestion is stand up right here in front of this video and do this with me. Let's reject what doesn't work. Try this. Put your feet so close together that your shoes are touching. And recognize that, of course, that's too narrow. I could push you over with a feather because your feet are too close together. You will neither look nor feel confident. Let's try the opposite of that, too wide gunslinger in a western. Well, that looks goofy in a different way. That doesn't work either. Let's look at too casual. If you came to my house and we stood around in my kitchen, it would be natural for me and perhaps for you to stand like this with my ankles crossed. It's natural, but of course it's too casual for public speaking. So if we reject those three choices, too narrow, too wide, too casual, here's what we're after. Just right. Feet about, shoulder width apart, and a little angle to those feet. Not standing as if I'm on downhill skis, but with a little bit of an angle. Maybe one toe slightly ahead of the other. That's the stance you want. That's the stance you adopt standing in front of the mirror saying, yeah, I like this suit, I think I'll buy it. It's that natural stance that makes you look and feel comfortable. Once those feet are planted, we need to think about the rest of the leg. Let's think about knees. It's very easy when nervous to lock your knees, to lock your knees backwards by tightening your thighs and lifting your kneecaps. Well, that will not make you look or feel very comfortable. So, we don't want that. And of course, the opposite of locking your knees is bending your knees. Well, we're not gonna stand there and crouch up and down as the public speaker. But somewhere between locked 
and crouching is just right. This feeling, this flexibility, almost like the knees are floating, the upper leg on the lower leg, is a feeling that we call subway knees. It's the kind of feeling that you have when you're riding on public transportation, you're holding on, the doors close, it's about to move, and what do you do at that moment? You have a little flexibility in your body, a little flexibility to take that energy of the vehicle beginning to move. It's that flexibility we're after. We're not looking for rigidity. Feet are planted, knees are floating, hips need to be centered. And for some of us, that's not particularly natural. Think about since adolescence, many of us have been standing with our weight shifted off to one side as I am now. But the problem with this position is my right leg is doing all the work. In fact, I can lift my left foot off the ground because it's not bearing any weight. Well, eventually the right leg gets tired and says, you do the work. And then the left leg gets tired and shifts back. No, you do the work and that's where the rocking starts, that kind of public speaking on the high seas quality. So the hips need to be centered, the knees need to be flexible and floating, the feet need to be planted. But if you do that, then you've got the big muscles of the body under your conscious control. And you want to ritualize this behavior so that every time you stand up, just like an athlete would, you adopt exactly the same stance. And after a while, you don't need to think about it. So plant your feet and stand still. Let's now consider what adrenaline's effects might be on our breathing. Our breath is the foundation of our voice. It can make our voice sound loud enough, it can make it beautiful, and it can make our listeners understand what we're saying. So breath, which can be so important to the listener, can be hard to control as the speaker because adrenaline is washing through our body and sending a lot of blood flow to the muscle that supports our breath. That muscle is the diaphragm and it sits under our rib cage right about here. Our diaphragm is big so it gets lots of blood flow from adrenaline and it can shake during an adrenaline rush in the same way that our knees can go wonga 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 wonga. If you've ever had that feeling of butterflies in your stomach, that's adrenaline. Sending blood flow to your diaphragm so it can shout or breathe faster in an emergency. But in the non-emergency of public speaking, how do we control our diaphragm and our breath? Let's just think about it for a few minutes. There are three important benefits we can get if we pay attention to our lungs and our breath. We can feel better, much more relaxed. We'll speak better, we'll support our voice. And in fact, we'll even think better if we get control of our breath. Let's talk about how we might feel better. Mechanically, when we're on vacation or at ease, we take big, luxurious breaths. Take a few with me now. Wherever you're sitting, sit up straight and put your back against the back of your chair, your feet flat on the floor. Take some big, deep breaths. Expand your lungs in all directions. If you're sitting with your back against the back of your chair, breathe into the back of that chair and feel that you're a 360 degree creature. Feel it in the back, so you take a breath and imagine that your lungs are expanding backwards. Let it out. Now take a breath and pretend that you're expanding your rib cage way out to the sides of the room. This type of slow breathing is what we do when we're on vacation, right? Lying in a hammock, reading a book in the summer, lying on the beach in your favorite vacation spot. Think about how those long breaths make you feel better, almost like you're on vacation. And one of our goals here in public speaking is to feel natural. If we can breathe as we do when we're on vacation, that brings our heart rate down and that makes our body say, hey, I'm feeling pretty good here. This feels natural and normal to me. 
So the first thing our breath can get for us is to make us feel natural, feel normal and relaxed in a non-stress situation. And that's one of the things we're after in public speaking, is to feel good. So breath, mindfully taken, deliberately breathed, can help you feel at ease when you're standing to speak. Our breath also powers our voice. So this big diaphragmatic muscle underneath our rib cage here is the thing that pushes air out when we take a breath. So with me right now, take a breath and let your ribs and lungs expand in all directions. They could expand pretty far. If you think about the big noisemakers in the world, say opera singers, they expand really far and it might look like this. <gasps> That's a full deep breath where an abdominal tissue falls forward and then the, the diaphragm pushes the air back up and over our vocal cords. Now when you're speaking, you'll probably have a jacket on so you won't have to worry if you expand too far. But take those deep abdominal breaths to increase your capacity. Breath air rushing back up over your vocal cords is what makes your voice sound beautiful or large. Soft-spoken people often only use the breath and a little bit of vocal cords vibrating to make a sound. But if you use a lot of breath over those vocal cords, the sound gets bigger and more beautiful and you'll feel confident. Sometimes we refer, we refer to that as your outside voice the one that makes more noise, but that's the one that has the most sound and flexibility and expressive quality. So if you get control of your breath, your voice is at its best. Finally, I did say that we think better if we get control of our breathing. The reason for that is our brains, even in lawyers, aren't very big, but they take a lot of air, a lot of oxygen to function. If I take a breath, my brain needs just about 20% of that entire breath and 80% goes to the rest of my body. So a very small area needs a lot of oxygen to function at its absolute best. So get control of your breath to flood your brain with oxygen. Make those neurons fire so you speak better with better ideas and better word choice. Make all the connections you need to as a speaker. Make that happen because you've taken enough breaths and flooded your, breath with flooded your brain with oxygen. So remember, you'll get three benefits if you get control of your breathing. You'll feel better. You'll feel like you're on vacation. You'll speak better because your voice is supported by air. And you'll think better because your brain is flooded with oxygen. So we have this dilemma about adrenaline and eye contact. There's some very interesting research about the fact that making eye contact with your audience is part of what triggers adrenaline. So it's a challenge to make eye contact with people triggering that adrenaline rush that we're trying to cope with. But at the same time, so much about eye contact is about credibility. In effect, can you look me in the eye and tell me this? And if you can't look me in the eye as a member of your audience, there's a credibility problem. So we have to look people in the eye, but as we look people in the eye, it gives us an even bigger adrenaline rush. In fact, one of my favorite studies about adrenaline and eye contact says this. If the audience would do us the favor of actually putting on sunglasses and therefore eliminating the literal contact between your eyes and my eyes as the audience, I would have a much lower adrenal response because it's all about eyes. But your audience will not do you that favor. And so much about eye contact is literally on a kind of animalistic level the sense of predator and prey. There are a lot of them and there's only one of you. They've often got the exits blocked so you can't run away. And as is true of all listeners and all audiences, for most of your presentation, they don't look that happy. They look like this. Now in real life, that would have meaning. If you came up to speak to me and I greeted you with that demeanor, you've got a question? 
You'd say to yourself, what's wrong with that guy? Why is he looking at me that way? So you have to make eye contact with people who are giving you nothing back. And my personal belief is that's why so many people are so uncomfortable with the idea of public speaking. They can't cope with the idea that they look out and everybody looks so dour with such a stone-cold expression on their face. Your job is to make that eye contact and to make that eye contact in a very specific way. You want to focus on the people and if it's a small audience, look at all of them before you begin. In other words, as you're planting the feet, taking that nice deep breath and looking at them, look at all of them. Let's get it over with looking at what I think of as that multi-eyed monster. If you're speaking to a huge crowd and there's no way to look at everyone, at least look at the four corners of the crowd. There's someone way over there and way in the back and way in the back and way over there, which will take you how long? A few seconds. Let me show you that behavior again in silence. So at least you frame the size of that audience that you need to look at. Then how long do you look at these people? You know, in normal conversation, as I'm speaking to you, I'm making this sustained eye contact, and for the most part, you're making sustained eye contact back. Well, we're not talking about that length of time, looking at each member of your audience for a sustained period of time and then another member of the audience, but there's some very useful research about what they are calling quiet eye training. And it basically has to do with quieting the motion of your eyes. Because if your eyes flit all over, you not only suggest that you are not comfortable, but you literally unfocus your brain. So look at my eyes as I engage in some of this behavior. Think about if as I talk to you, my eyes shoot to the ceiling, to the floor, to the wall, to the wall. The more I do that, the more you think, boy, that guy has got a problem. And the more I do have a problem because I cannot focus my brain when my eyes are flitting all over the room. So you've got to focus your eyes to focus your brain. So we want to, in effect, quiet your eyes. When you stand up to look at those people, make more sustained eye contact, maybe two or three seconds with each person. So you're slowing it down, so you're calming down your eyes. They're not rushing around the room. Now, there are some people who teach public speaking and suggest that one way around this issue is to talk to people's foreheads or hairlines. My own personal feeling is I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to talk to foreheads or hairlines. I know how to talk to people by looking them directly in the eye. And I can't really contact you and connect with you if I am not making that kind of contact. But once you acknowledge that that's part of the challenge, that ability to say, I will focus my eyes on the eyes of these people looking at me despite their very sober expressions, you've got a way to give even your eyes a very specific instruction. So we've told the feet what to do, plant those feet. We've told the breath what to do, breathe consciously and mindfully. We've told the eyes what to do, quiet those eyes and make contact. And by doing that, we've given lots of control over adrenaline to the body by engaging in those specific actions. So to sum up what you've learned in this program, here are the mantras. In other words, here are the things to say to yourself. You want to talk to yourself and say, You're nervous. That's good. That will give you energy to perform. Go ahead, say it. Say this to yourself. Take three more deep breaths right now to calm down while waiting to speak. Say that. Don't say a word until you are standing still and your feet are planted. Don't say And finally, say this to yourself, quiet your eyes and focus on the person or people that you're talking to before you begin to speak. And if you do that, you will have a way of channeling that adrenaline with very mindful instructions to your legs, to your breath, and to your eyes.